Good morning. You guys want to move down a little bit. You don't need to. We're just for for a small tiny community. Come on, move down. It's okay. Suggestions. 
We sent something to the teachers, said, what do you want to hear about? And we got something back that was very different than what we've gotten back for the last three years prior. It wasn't about using technology. It wasn't about using social media. It wasn't about the collection of data. It was about something that is at the very grain and at the very heart of what journalism truly is. It was about the truth versus the non-truth and the, what has become a very gray area in between. So one of the things you are going to hear a lot about today are words that are now comfortable and part of our lexicon. Fake news. Alternative facts. All of these words that we now have to live with every day. So this day has morphed a little bit. It's morphed from a how do you shape the collection of news to how do you make sure that the people that are touching your news and reading your news and consuming your news know that what you put out there is a fact, that it's verified, that it is multi-sourced, that it is all of these different things that makes journalism different than, as I was driving in, I was listening to Mike and Mike, Slappy on his couch with Cheeto crumbs on his finger putting whatever he wants on the internet. Alright? We're going to start off that entire conversation with a panel discussion. I'm going to turn it over to Paul Grandal at this time. Paul is now the director of the New York State Writers Institute, which is based at the University of Albany. So things have changed in the last four years. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Paul. He's going to take it Paul. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Greg, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm looking forward to all of you um, challenging yourselves today, asking some questions, getting a little bit out of your comfort zone, and talking about the, the topics that, that Greg just addressed. And to help us do that is a remarkable panel. Um, they are here for the Logan Nonfiction Program. So it's a bit of a, a contradiction. You think if you're a, a writer, a reporter, a nonfiction author, you're sort of in the thick of Twitter and, and all the breaking news. But what makes this place special is its solitude and its remoteness. When you really need to write a book, I've written several myself, need to shut everything out. That's what I find. I have kids who are 21 and 27, finishing college and in graduate school, and, and I always had this discussion about focus. If you want to be a great athlete, a great musician, a great artist, a great writer, you need to focus, which means this great device I have in my pocket, which has been buzzing this morning with things, exciting things, and people who want to reach me, and, and stuff I need to know, you kind of have to shut that out. So the people here who I'll introduce in a minute have come here to shut things out, to go deep into their subject of interests and expertise, uh, to write a book, um, which is a, a marathon. You know, what we do as daily journalists, I spent 33 years at the Albany Times Union, is, is a sprint, it's a series of sprints. And now, with the 24-hour news cycle and everybody on social media, it's, it's even shorter than a sprint. It's quick little dashes, but. A book is a long marathon, takes discipline, takes focus, it takes shutting things out. And we're really honored to have this, this very uh, um, accomplished group of writers and filmmakers. So I'll start with Tom Jennings. He's the second from the left in the glasses. He's the director of the Logan Nonfiction Program. He also teaches at New York University. He's a very accomplished documentary filmmaker. He's made many uh, films for PBS Frontline. I'm not going to list all of them because people here have long, long stellar resumes, but he, he's working at the highest level of the documentary uh, film uh, world. Uh, next to me, Adrienne LeBlanc. She is here uh, to work on a book, a little bit of a departure in a way, stand-up comedy. Um, and you might see uh, our, our uh, panelists at around lunchtime if you have questions, if you want to ask them something. I think they'll be available. But she, she was really uh, acclaimed for a book that she wrote called Random Family, Love, Drugs, Trouble, and Coming of Age in the Bronx. Followed for more than a decade, one family uh, deep in poverty and a lot of other social uh, struggles. And they eventually came to Troy, so she knows Troy very well. And um, 
she won a MacArthur Genius Grant, which is, if you don't know, it's, it's uh, one of the highest honors for a creative artist, and it, it gives you some freedom and some funding to do your work without worrying about going out to get an award. So I don't know if you want to be called a genius, but it's a no. great, <laughs> it's a great honor. Uh, Sylvia Harvey, we were just speaking. Um, she's going deep into a, an issue about prisons. You know, this country we have more people incarcerated than any, uh, you know, developed nation in the world. She's been working on a project for quite a while on uh, the children of incarcerated parents, 2.7 million children, parents in prison. And she's working on a book proposal and a, a long-term uh, narrative book project on that issue. She also is part of uh, the nation, uh, lives in New York City. And finally, Raphael Minder, he is uh, from Switzerland originally. He's written extensively for Bloomberg News, Financial Times, now he's uh, an international correspondent for the New York Times, based in Madrid, Spain. So please welcome our panelists. Now, as Greg said, this issue of fake news, what is the truth, what does it mean when you say alternative facts? We have a president who's declared members of the media enemy of the people. So we're going to get into some of those issues today because it impacts what all of them do as journalists and truth tellers and what I do in my job now at the New York State Writers Institute, which is to bring stellar talent like we have on this panel. So I'm going to start with a, a sort of a broad question. I just got Time Magazine. Does anyone still get Time Magazine? They actually sell it on the newsstand. Excellent. I don't like the typewriter. Most people probably look at it online, but I like I like print still. I did have the last typewriter in the Times Union newsroom. That's not fake news. That's true. And the people said it was too loud. They were IBM Selectrics, and uh, I had to get rid of it, which which hurt me. Um, but anyway, Time Magazine just had a cover story: "Is Truth Dead?" Kind of playing on its cover from 30 years ago: "Is God Dead?" So I'll throw it out to who wants to, to, to dig in. Is truth dead? Are we in this post-truth world, which was the most searched term in uh, Miriam Dictionary in 2016? So, so what do we mean truth and post-truth? Who wants to? Tom, are you going to, as the director, are we going to throw it to you? Yes. <laughs> the wise sage of Rensselaerville? Uh, that's the same <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious about you guys, actually. Uh, do you guys believe in uh, truth? Do you guys believe that there is, there's like an objective reality? Just raise your hand. <laughs> okay. And are you guys all interested in doing journalism and reporting? Like, seriously? Okay. To some extent? Okay. <laughs> So the reason why I'm asking is because we don't, we as, as panelists here are, are old, old folks, generally speaking, relative to you. And I'm sorry to speak for you guys, but we don't have a connection to uh, a lot. We have social media, we, we exist in it, but I think a lot of the discussion about truth and what is truth and post-truth comes from this kind of this, 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 uh, this fracturing between generations in some ways, because we assumed and we lived with this idea for all of our careers and our lives that you could go out and you could report, you could actually, you know, get the facts, and the facts were, you know, they're immutable, meaning they can change based on who was giving you the facts, but it's your job as a journalist separated you, what really separated you was going out and getting to the bottom of it, actually proving and testing the truth. And now we're at a point where, uh, not because of the younger generation, but just because of social trends and technology, and social media in particular, it's testing the boundaries of what truth is traditionally. And all these new devices are coming in uh, and changing this, the speed of the news cycle, which used to be you know, 24 hours, or it used to be actually daily, and then 24 hours, and now it's, you know, every second. And um, I think that truth is, is the, is the, the first uh, casualty now in, 
in the war or the, the growth of this new business, the social media world. So I feel like truth does exist, and I feel like it can be proven and, and, and found. And that's our job as journalists. It's a very noble profession, I feel. And I'm very defensive about it. Um, but I think it's being tested every moment of the day by the technology and how people are using the technology. And the fact that there's a, a certain group, this kind of notion of democratization, democratization of information is a great concept, but in practice it also has uh, a dark side. Um, that's my opening gambit. Does anyone want to add to it? Uh, I guess I'll just add. Um, I like to consider myself a truth purveyor. Like, I almost have an obsession with the truth. If I talk to friends, whether it's about journalism, whether it, whatever it is, I'm like, but is that true? I'm always trying to get the answers. I'm always asking questions and sort of going to the source. So I think that there's something to be said about what we believe to be true and what are facts, right? So how do you interpret the facts? I think that's where we get into trouble. Some people take a fact and they'll interpret it in a way that is, is not honest, is not true, right? So what is your version of the truth is, I think, where it gets complicated. If it's something that is factual, then we know this. There's no debating that. But if we're getting into a truth that you believe personally is something that is that sort of goes beyond the fact, but has stemmed from the fact that it's a different kind of truth, but it's still your personal truth, but it's rooted in something. So I think the problem comes in when we decide that this is my truth and it's not rooted in anything factual. So if you have a personal truth, it still needs to be rooted in something factual. It still needs to be rooted in something historical. It still needs to be rooted in something that you can prove. So if it's not something that you can prove or it's not something that has history or not something that has bearing, then how do you get to say it's true? You can say it's a personal truth, but how do you get to say definitively, this is true, this is a reality, this is fact? So I think that, you know, that's something we need to have. What is the basis for this belief that we carry? Um, yeah, following up on Sylvia's comments, uh, as an undergraduate, I studied philosophy first, and uh, probably the first philosopher I looked at seriously is, uh, was uh, René Descartes. Um, and uh, he basically spent his whole life deciding what is the truth. And he did all sorts of experiments, boiled it down to questioning anything that was around him. Every, he said, like, if I see this, is it a tower? Is it really round? Is it square? Depending on where I'm looking from, it looks completely different. And the only thing that he finally ended up with was a, is a famous phrase which is cogito ergo sum, which is I think, therefore I am. That's the only part that he said, I'm confident is a truth. And I think Sylvia made the point, everything is an interpretation. Uh, it's basically, and everything depends on your perspective, literally, possibly your visual perspective, but obviously your intellectual perspective, your background, your your means to get to the information, your, your goals. So we should, I think, bear that in mind that uh, I, I see journalism as a, still a channel of the truth. Um, what I think has changed, and that's uh, uh, what Tom was basically saying, is that we used to have a, a certain ownership, uh, and it was a profession. And I think social media has completely destroy the boundaries. People, now they say, who is a journalist? And it's a good question, it's a legitimate question. And it used to be that essentially information, although it was still interpreted, there is no such thing, I believe, as just the truth. It's an interpretation that is, has to be as close as possible to what you think are objective values and objective statements. But this interpretation is now open to everybody. And that is, uh, that is a big change. In other words, we've lost uh, the ownership of, of, of our profession. And in that process, we are seeing all sorts of issues because people motivated by completely different things are, are entering and are on the, in a way on the same level playing field. They may not yet quite be there. They, we, some of us may have a brand, maybe that gives us supposedly more credibility, but even then, I think they're, they're almost there because really it's more about the speed at which you can access your readership or your viewership 
And so you, you, if it so happens that your, your piece of information gets viral, then you're, you're ahead. Um, but I think it's, it, I think those are the, the, the fundamental change is, is I, I feel sometimes that we are no longer in a profession recognized as such. And I have people question openly, what gives me, why am I more a journalist? And this is not a new phenomenon, it's just accelerated. 20, 20 years ago, I joked with my father, when he, he was contributing to newsletters, and he's not a journalist, and I said, you know, you're becoming my competitor. But he's, a, he's a busy, busy person who likes to get, get stuck in all sorts of things. He said, like, I, you know, I want to write about this. You know, read, you read something and you keep with his spare time writing. Now this is completely the norm. Anyone who has a thought, an idea, or will just get it out of it. Um, I, I feel like I'm a very concrete thinker about, like, if I think, like, what is truth, like, where in my life is truth very clear? And, for example, it would be, like, with money. If I owe somebody $100, there's no confusion about the truth of that amount of money, right? It's $100. Money is something people can pretty quickly agree about a lot of facts, right, in a lot of ways. Or the places where I rely on the truth. Uh, with my closest friends, right? The people that will really tell you what they really think, how valuable that is, that kind of connection, right? So anything as simple as you're dressed up and you're like, does my hair look okay? Is your friend gonna say it does or it doesn't? I mean, it's a small example, but those, and I say, how is it when it comes to other kinds of information that I need to be a, a responsible kind of conscious person in the world where do I get that information? Whether it's about a trip I'm taking, and information about a place I'm going, or whether it's about something very complicated like the workings of the government, right? So I am from the same school of sort of training where you go out and you spend a lot of time talking to lots of different people, you observe a lot of different things, and you get a lot of facts and you try to put them together, right? Um, but um, what I'm, I've come to, and I used to think that that would equal people changing behavior. So I spent a lot of years writing about poverty because I thought if people understood how it worked, they wouldn't be so quick to make dumb suggestions to people that are struggling, right? That they would know what was actually happening and they would make more useful um, contributions to getting rid of the problems and the suffering that comes from that. But what I learned over time is that there's the truth, there's the gathering part of it, and, and how you arrange it in a way that has integrity. But then there's getting people to hear the truth. Because a lot of time, there have always been historically people that tell the truth, and they're often not heard. People don't listen to them. People, it's terrifying sometimes to hear the truth, right? It's hard to tell people the truth. Like if you're breaking up with somebody you don't want to be with anymore, that's not like an easy truth, for example, right? So. Part of why I'm writing about comedy and comedians is because I think there are people that are trying to get to the truth in a way that people can hear by jokes, right? You can't talk directly about racism, for example, in a way that's productive often, but you can make jokes about it that can show you your own racism. You can sort of hear it in a way that breaks through the resistance we have to the truth. So I think when I think about all these issues about media and technology, I'm curious about how are these forms of, you know, these devices and the people that are putting content into, onto the web or whatever, what are they doing to reach me, right? So when I'm reading an article and they have that list, you know, like, you know, five Hollywood stars who didn't make it, what they're doing today from, from work, or, you know, all those things that I just go off and click onto, I'm saying, how is that connected to what I'm reading? You know, how are all these things operating? So I feel there's a lot of different ways that it, it's a great thing you can talk about today, it's just there's so many different parts, and I'm especially interested in the strategies for how do you get people to think you're telling the truth, or whether you are or not, and um, how it's marketed, all, all that stuff. That's great. Now, I'd like all of you students to be thinking about questions so it's easier to write them down. I'll ask one or two more to get things going, but I really want to open it up to all of you. So. Um, in a couple minutes, you know, raise your hand, um, or if anyone has one right now, sometimes it's always hard to ask the first question in a group in the morning, so we'll warm, warm it up a little bit, but think of your questions. All right, you got one. Yes, sir. We're talking about the truth. How do we actually combat this issue of fake news and um, 
alternative facts? Uh, I would say that we have to start with the personal, right? So I think one of the big problems that I've seen is that people are spreading misinformation, right? So if there's a story that you haven't properly vetted, then you shouldn't share it. You'll get something and they'll say, you know, 3,000 people were killed at the bottom of this ship, wherever. You're like, oh my God, that's crazy. And you just forward it, and then your friend forwards it, and then you tweet it, and then someone else tweets it, and then retweet it. So we're sending this misinformation without doing our proper homework. So I think before we decide that we're going to believe something is true, have we vetted it? Have we found out where those sources come from? Have we figured out who wrote this, where it originated, and whether or not they have any grounds for making this argument. So I think, for me, I would say the first step is to not be blind to information, to not just take something as a truth, but to evaluate it. So the minute you see something that seems you know, outrageous or dramatic or even you know, interesting, you say, well, where did this come from? Who wrote this? What was their motive? Who were their sources? And why should I believe this? So I think that that's, for me, I would say the first step is is to not just pass the information without doing your own homework. Because if you do, then you're just perpetuating, you know, disinformation. So you're saying, this is true. So you just told 10 different people something that's not accurate. And they've told another 50 people. And it's sort of spreading like wildfire. And it's partially because we've gone into something blindly. So I would just say at the personal level, the very basis um, is, is being aware of what you are consuming and how you're sharing it. But I would add that you need to you need to challenge yourself about your own sources. <coughs> Not just as journalists, we talk about sourcing a lot. Uh, and then, but we, we go to a multiplicity of different places to go checking our sources. And I think the problem with social media and our online experience, all of us as individuals, journalists or non-journalists, is this notion of siloing. Do you guys know that term? Siloing, does anybody know that term? Siloing is the idea that you reinforce your own worldview online. The information that you go get is the information that you already have. These preconceived notions are reaffirmed. And then the silo, like a, like a corn silo, you're living in that of your own construction. And so you're only suddenly seeing the world through your own ideas. When in reality is, there's a multiplicity of views on any given topic. And so to challenge yourself to go out and do what Sylvia is saying is absolutely important, never accepting anything at face value but also challenge yourself when you're online and you just really want that thing that affirms your own base belief. It's so nice. It feels so good just to go get that information that confirms what your suspicion is. But what you have to do these days especially is challenge your own, challenging your own suspicions and really vet everything that comes through. That's right. Good question. Um, I will ask another question, but, but think of your questions as well. So, I was in the newspaper as a reporter for a long time. I still write one story a week because I love newspapers and I love the truth. But we used to joke that if you could find three people who agreed on anything, you had a trend. And there was a time in the 90s especially where trend stories were everything. I also think of the great American writer Mark Twain who said there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. We talked about money. Every time an unemployment jobs figure comes out, nobody agrees. The numbers, that, you know, are, are concrete, but the interpretation, as Raphael was saying. So, as Tom said, there's a multiplicity of viewpoints uh, on any story. You could choose a hundred people to interview. So, selection, I think, is the first step in journalism. Why do you choose? These three out of the hundred, instead of the other 97, is it simply because they returned your calls? Are you making choices based on your kind of biases or where you think the story is going beforehand? So how do you make selection on, on each story, a basic story? How do you pick your sources? Well, I'll say I'm just um, sort of genetically wired to be interested in people that aren't considered, uh, they aren't famous. So for example, if I'm writing about stand-up comedy, I'm not interested in the most famous comedians. I'm interested in people that are somehow a little more um, off the normal continuum, right? So if I'm writing about money, which poverty is partly what you're writing about, I'm not interested in people that have all the money. I'm interested in all the rest of us who have varying degrees of less money. 
Right? So I'm very interested in ordinary people that aren't used to the press, that aren't um, familiar with talking about, they don't talk in sound bites, they don't have publicists, people that, um, it's been challenging in this book because I'm writing about show business, but I'm interested in people that aren't, don't have a kind of way of speaking about their lives that's practiced. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm looking for. Um, I, I covered for quite a long time uh, public administration in Brussels of the European Union, and I think um, what I found, and I've it's generally been the case is that, and it's bit, what Adrian says, that the frontline people are not your best sources. Uh, the starting point I have is that there's no such thing as a free lunch, and so everyone has a vested interest. Uh, you always have to ask yourself, why would that person spend any time, free time, and they're not getting paid, talking to me? And um, I've, I've found in general that the best sources are the ones who are close to the decision making, but are not the decision makers. Because they don't get, in any case, any credit for the decision. So in public administration, we're talking about people who may be chief of staff, or number three in the ministry, or in general, people who are actually doing the work for the top person. The top person gets at the end the brief, comes out, says it, gives a press conference, but that hasn't actually done the work. So not only is that person less informed, but is much more at stake. They are the voice, supposedly, of authority on that subject. The second level, they know the information, and generally, they may even have all sorts of internal issues with the way that information is then given at the top. So they can be a fantastic source. Because they themselves actually are annoyed at the thought of how what they worked on gets presented. This is a very common pattern. So why do they want to speak to you? Because they want to correct the official line of their own work. This is an example, I would say, of uh, in, in a different context, but of, of what Adrian's telling us, which is uh, the less they have to gain uh, from the public exposure, the more perhaps truthful their account may be, because they and these people are generally people who don't want in any way to to be quoted. So then, obviously, their source that sourcing has to be verified and uh, and compared with the official line or with with some another person's view. But in terms of the content, I've generally found these are among the best sources you can find. So not necessarily the person who looks great on the page because someone, some of your friends will say, my God, you've managed to speak to the head of the ministry or the head of the corporation. Well, that's good, but remember that person has a lot more interests at stake, much more reasons to twist the facts. Uh, I just add to that for thinking about um, sources in terms of characters. Like I do long form nonfiction narrative. So in a story, let's say I did a story recently um, that was looking at the 20 week abortion ban. So there's an abortion ban in a number of states that say that at this point, women can no longer um, see terminations. And the women that I decided to cover were women that reached the 20 week mark and learned that their, their fetuses had lethal anomalies that their babies were going to die, whether they were going to die in utero or whether they were going to die three minutes after birth. And some of them didn't want to carry the next four months. Some of them wanted to induce their labor. And in some states, that wasn't allowed. So if I want to articulate that, you know, 20 week abortion bans do this to women mentally, emotionally, um, and physically, and this is what their voice looks like, then I'm going to, you know, report that story, but I'm also going to look for the lead character for going to show you the, the depths of what it's like. Here's this woman that when she learned that, you know, her baby would not live, this is what her experience was like. And then when you're able to see the full experience of this character, of this source, then you understand the policy. So I don't have to go to the head of Planned Parenthood or, you know, to speak to every politician because we know those facts. We include that. But what is this, what is the story here? Who is the person that's going to convince us to listen or to pay attention to something that doesn't impact us, but impacts them. So I, I would say when I'm thinking about um, sources in the form of characters, is who 
who are, are these characters going to be compelling? But compelling in an honest way, not someone that, I'm going to just pick this person because they're the most dramatic. It's like, no, this is a real event, and people should know this is a real event, and it stemmed from this kind of policy. And this is just one or three of the women that this has impacted. But just realize that there could be hundreds more we don't know about. And I just think that, for me, I'm always thinking about how do you push forward um, what it is we want people to know about. If it's policy, how do we convince people that this is a policy we want you to pay attention to? And sometimes we you know, use the, the sources as characters to say, this is the problem, and this is what it does to people, and this is how it impacts me at this level. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. How about a student or a teacher question? Yes. Um, so we talk about like truth and facts. Um, do you think, as a journalist, it's your job to convey your truth or to convey the facts? Good yeah, very good question. Yeah, what's your name? <laughs> it's a journalist. It's a great question. Yeah, very good question. I was going to tie um, Okay. So, your truth or fact, right? Um, I did a story uh, that looked at the end of extended family visits for prisoners. And in that story, there were a lot of I would say mostly there were black families that were saying that they removed these extended family visits because they're racist. They did this because we're black. And I'm like, oh, yeah, like, really? It kind of makes sense. We're looking at the legacy of racism in this country, but what is the, what kind of support do we have for that? Sure, I can quote this person as saying they feel as though this was something that was perpetuated by, you know, racism and so forth. But instead, I go back and I do the research. I'm going to go back to 1918 and find out that, yeah, in 1918, when they started these visits, they were because they believed black men had higher libidos and they needed to be tamed. And the one way you could tame them was making sure that they had, you know, sex. All right, we give them sex, they're going to work hard on our, you know, penal farming industry. Um, so we give them what they need. So if we look at, okay, well, it did kind of start, you know, in a way where only black men got this. White men didn't get it for another 20 or 30 years, and then women after that. So we already know there's some racial bias that started this visit, right? And then when we find out that, oh, the visits were ended in part because they said that there was 